on approximately one hour. And with that, I'll now turn the call over to CORE. CORE, if you would, please. Thanks, Kevin. And welcome, everyone, to this call, and thank you for your interest in Teva. I will review some of our key business highlights, and then um, Ellie will review the financials, and then we'll have time for q and I'm very happy to report that uh, we met all our key components of our 2020 financial guidance. As you've seen, our revenues came in at $16.7 billion, the non-GAAP operating income at $4.4 billion, and the non-GAAP EBITDA at $4.9 billion. The non-GAAP EBS came in slightly above our guidance at $2.57, and the free cash flow came in at $2.1 billion. On the business side, a lot of uh, important things happened. You could say the overarching thing for 2020 was the COVID-19 pandemic and the successful navigation of the pandemic by the company and by the employees. We did our utmost to protect the employees, and by doing so, we were able to protect our supply chain with minimal disruption and also continue our R&D programs and our product launches. I'll get back to Ostero, Ajovi, and Tuxima on the following slides, but I'd like to mention the very successful launch of the first versions of the treatments Truvada and Atripla for HIV treatments, so generic versions of those products were launched by us in the fourth quarter in the U.S., a very successful generic launch. We also just uh, launched in the U.S. Numerang, and we're very happy to have this approval for a complex generic. We're also very pleased with the phase three results we got from our Risperidon LAI. As you know, patients suffering from schizophrenia really need better long-acting therapy where they don't have to have intramuscular injections, where they don't have problems with reconstitution. And this product is a ready-to-use, long-acting product, subcutaneously injected by a thin needle, so it will improve convenience and compliance, hopefully, with uh, strong benefits for people suffering from schizophrenia. We also launched DigiHaler, uh, the whole DigiHaler portfolio in the U.S., and uh, in these times of e-health, we are very optimistic that the DigiHaler portfolio products can help people suffering from asthma and other respiratory diseases to improve the treatment and the compliance with their treatment to the benefit of their health outcomes. If we move to the next slide, then uh, I'll just give you a few comments to our revenue development. And uh, we did have a strange year in the sense that in Q1 uh, 2020, as you can see from the European green bar, there we had a um, unexpected extra sales in the form of patient level hoarding as the pandemic, pandemic hit and the first lockdowns happened in Europe. So we basically sold 200 million more in the first quarter in Europe than we would normally do. And uh, then that, that came back as 200 million less in the Q2. And then we sort of normalized in Europe uh, at the end of the year in Q4. In the US, we didn't have the same swings. We didn't have the same hard lockdowns as we saw in Europe. And you basically see we were sort of going at the normal run rate of around 2 billion per quarter. And then in Q4, we had the lift up basically coming from the launch of uh, Truvada and a tripler. And the rest of the business was pretty steady over the quarters. Uh, no uh, dramatic changes there. If we move to the next slide, and then I'll give a few comments to Ostero. Ostero keeps growing very strongly. We had a 65% increase over 19 in our revenues in 2020, and we also expect it to keep on growing strongly, as you will see from our guidance. We have a good growth in prescriptions, good growth in our sales. And what I always mention when we talk about Ostero is the huge uh, potential. There's a huge unmet medical need in the form of tardive dyskinesia. We are estimating that we have around 500,000 patients suffering from tardive dyskinesia in the U.S. Of course, not everybody will be treated at all times, but as you can see from our patient numbers, and if you look at the numbers of our one and only competitor, then we are only scratching the surface in meeting the medical needs of people suffering from tardive dyskinesia. So for that reason, I'm optimistic that Ostedo will continue to grow also the coming years. If we move to the next slide, then um, we have a bit of a roller coaster story uh, for Joby in the U.S. We had a really good launch. And then we lost uh, competitive power, you could say, due to the fact that we did not have an auto-injector. Our two competitors both launched with an auto-injector. We were delayed regulatory-wise, and you saw our NBRX share go from 30 all the way down to 11. Then we finally launched our auto-injector, which I think is best in class, very high-quality Swiss product, really easy to use. And if you combine that uh, new and better device, which then meant that we got back into a better capture rate with an NBRX share of around 25%, if you combine this better device and the increase in our catch rate with the fact that we do have unbeaten efficacy and we have a longer duration of action than any of the competitors, and due to the longer duration of action, we can offer both quarterly and monthly therapy, then I'm actually quite optimistic about the potential for Jovi in terms of market share. And I've been saying since the launch that we would be happy to get 25% of the market. I'm sort of upping that ambition a bit and saying that I really think with the unsurpassed efficacy, the longer duration of action, and a clearly high-quality, very convenient auto-injector, I don't see why we cannot have a long-term aspiration in the U.S. of having a third of the market. And that, by the way, fits very well with Europe where in some of the countries where we have launched, uh, and that's many by now, in some of the countries where we launched early, we are already now getting close to a third of the market. So uh, so good development on the market share for uh, Adjovi. If we move to the next slide, 
Then many of you probably remember that I've been talking about biosimilars as a future cornerstone of our presence in, you could say, the overall generic space. And um, here we had to prove ourselves with the launch of Tuxima because we had to prove that we could get a good market share. There has been, you could say, some disappointment on the penetration rate for biosimilars in the U.S. over the last five to ten years. I think with Tuxima we have proven that we can get the volume share. We are up to 24% now. Um, I don't think that we will you know, go from 24 to 48% in the next 12 months, but I do think we have a sustainable market share that we can increase. There's more competition now. We have two competitors and the originator, but uh, this is a very good business for us. It's a solid market share we have already. We think we can expand it, and uh, we're very optimistic also about the benefits of our broad future portfolio in biosimilars, which I'll actually address on the next slide. So if you look at our overall biosimilar and specialty pipeline, then you can see here that we, by now, we have a very broad uh, biosimilar pipeline, roughly uh, 10 products, half of them our own internal development, half of them what came in with the in-licensing deal we made with Albertech. And um, we're very excited about this, and we think it will be a very good business for us for the coming uh, many years. I can also mention here that you can see that Risperidon LAI, of course, we're getting ready for submission there. Hopefully, we can submit, get approval, and launch sometime next year. And, of course, uh, we're also waiting to see uh, the outcome for the competing product to Ficinomab, Tenesomab, which has an advisory committee coming up. So uh, it will be exciting to see there what happens. And uh, together with our partner, Regeneron, we'll be following that closely, hoping that we can file the product this year. I won't give any more comments to all the details, but you can see we have a broad portfolio of both biopharmaceuticals and biosimilars. If we move to the next slide, then another cornerstone of our strategy is to continuously improve our manufacturing in terms of efficiency and cost, and thereby increasing our gross margin and our operating margin. Now, I won't talk about all these elements. Uh, I've talked to you about it before. It's really not rocket science. It's what you do when you want to improve your manufacturing operation. It's uh, more than a 1,000 sub-projects under these five categories. I'll just mention two things where you can clearly see and where we're sharing with you what we're doing. On the network side, I'll show you just in a minute how we've developed uh, by reducing the number of manufacturing sites we have, and we'll continue that. And that, of course, benefits by increasing the scale effect on the remaining sites, increasing and concentrating the volumes. And also on the supply chain, just uh, given COVID-19 and everything that's been happening, the, uh, you could say, consolidation and the overview and the smart use of IT for reviewing your supply chain at all times, securing both your manufacturing supply chain and distribution supply chain is critical. And I'd like to mention here that also the supply chain, you know, from manufacturing to patients is critical. And we are very happy about the support that Teva has been able to give to the state in Israel in its vaccination program, where we are pay playing a key role, being the company doing all the logistics, getting the vaccines from the airport into the warehouse, into all the 400 uh, vaccination centers in Israel, and thereby securing a very fast vaccination process in Israel based on logistics and, uh, of course, supplier products. If we move to the next slide, then I promise you to give you a short uh, look into our consolidation of our manufacturing sites. What you can see here is that over the last three years, we've gone from 80 to around 60 manufacturing sites, but we're not stopping there. As you can see here at the bottom, we have uh, additional 11 sites where we have announced that they will either be divested or closed, and that, of course, sets us up for a reduction down to 50 sites, and uh, then I'm sure later on we can do even more consolidation. And uh, we have different examples. We have recently divested in countries such as Japan, Thailand, Russia, Serbia, and so on. So, so it's a lot of smaller sites that we are closing and concentrating the volume on our bigger sites and thereby getting better manufacturing efficiencies. And you can see that on the next slide. Here I'm showing you the operating margin. And uh, you can see the negative development from 17 to 19, basically as a consequence of the loss of revenue on Copaxon, which was a very high operating margin uh, product. And then you can see how we are fighting our way back, moving from 24.5% operating margin in 19 up to 26.3 in 2020. The midpoint of our guidance for this year is 26.8, and our long-term target at the end of 23 is 28%, and that's a target we are firmly committed to. If you move to this next slide, then you can see another development that we are firmly committed to, the reduction in our net debt, and you can see the development since I joined the company in Q3-17 until now, where we have reduced the debt by some $10 billion. You should continue to see that going forward. The only reason why the graph has gone a little flat the last two quarters is actually the currency adjustment on our euro-denominated debt, which has led, of course, to some increase in the dollar-converted number for that debt, which has slowed down the debt reduction a little bit, but it will pick up again strongly here in, uh, in 21. And if we move to the, my last slide here, uh, then I'm happy to repeat uh, the long-term financial targets, and there's no change here. Apart from the design, we moved to three green round circles, and that's, of course, you could say, our little contribution here warming up to the next slide, which is an ESG slide, 
But these are financials, uh, 28% operating income margin at the end of 23. We're firmly committed to that. More than 80% cash earnings and a net debt to EBITDA below three times. And in order to secure that, we will, of course, use our cash flow to pay down debt. And um, as a side remark, which I've said for the last three years, we don't have any plan to raise equity. We want the current shareholders to get the full benefit of our improvements in the business. Now, I have a last slide on ESG, uh, which I'd like to show you. I won't comment on all the great things we're doing. I've just picked the E, so to speak, the environmental piece. And I just want to review briefly our 2030 environmental uh, long-term targets. One is focused on greenhouse gases to cut our emissions by a third. Another is focused on the energy, both the energy efficiency and also the uh, continued increase in use of renewable energy sources. And then the last one is really focused on waste and recycling of waste and uh, then reducing and minimizing antimicrobial discharge. It's a project we do together with a lot of other companies in the pharmaceutical industry to basically secure that we won't have problems with resistant bacteria and to ensure that we have a reduction in the risk of this happening to, to all of us by working together across the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry. So with this, uh, I would like to hand over to Eli, who will review the financials. Thank you, Cor, and good morning and afternoon to everyone. I hope you all have a safe and healthy 2021. I will begin my review of our 2020 financial results with my main focus being on the fourth quarter performance. This will be followed by an introduction to our 2021 NANGAP guidance and some of the important assumptions behind it. While most of the discussion around 2021 guidance will come at the end of my presentation, in a few spots along the way, I will touch upon our expectation regarding forward-looking trends to assist you with your modeling. So please take the note of this. Beginning on slide 17, we start with a review of our gap performance. The fourth quarter was the strongest quarter of 2020 with regards to net revenues totaling 4.5 billion. While relatively flat compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, sales were up 12% compared to the third quarter of 2020. The strong sequential performance was supported by growth in all segments, especially North America, which benefited from the strong launches of our generic version of Trovada and Atripla, as well as the continued strength of Osedo and Truxima. In Q4 2020, we recorded a gap operating income of 406 million versus 148 million in Q4 2019. Gap income of 150 million versus 110 million in Q4 2019 and a gap earning per share of 14 cents versus 10 cents in the same period in 2019. The year-over-year -year improvement in gap operating income, net income, and earning per share was mainly driven by the successful launch of generic Trovado and Tripla in the U.S., coupled with the lower level of intangible asset impairments. Turning to slide 18. You can see that the net gap adjustment in the fourth quarter of 2020 were 603 million. NANGAP income and NANGAP EPS for the fourth quarter of 2020 were adjusted to exclude these items, with the largest being amortization of purchased intangible assets totaling 262 million, of which 231 million included in cost of goods sold and remaining 31 million in selling and marketing. This quarterly amount for amortization is aligned with the range of 250 million to 260 million per quarter that we guided to at the beginning of 2020 and we expect it to be the same in 2021. Impairment of assets and accelerated depreciation totaled 236 million in the fourth quarter of 2020, which was mainly associated with the impairment of identified product rights of 127 million in the U.S. Turning to slide 19, we we'll review our NAN-GAAP performance. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, quarterly revenue was 4.5 billion, which was flat compared to Q4 2019, and annual revenues were 16.7 billion, a decline of 1% compared to full year 2019. NANGAP gross profit was $2.3 billion in the fourth quarter of 2020, flat compared to the fourth quarter of 2019. NANGAP gross profit margin was 52.3% in the fourth quarter of 2020, compared to 50.6% in the fourth quarter of 2019. The year-over-year -year increase in NANGAP gross profit margin was due to our efforts to reduce our cost of goods sold as part of our long-term financial targets and due to the strong launches of our generic versions of Trovada and Atripla in the U.S. Full year 2020 NANGAP gross margin was 52.4% versus 51.5% in full year 2019. NANGAP operating income in the fourth quarter of 2020 was 1.1 billion, an increase of approximately 7% compared to the fourth quarter of 2019. NANGAP operating margin was 25.6% in the fourth quarter of 2020 compared to 23.8% in the fourth quarter of 2019. The increase was mainly due to the aforementioned strength of our generic launches in the U.S., continued growth of Osedo, and continued focus on an efficient discipline cost structure. Full year 2020 NANGAP operating margin was 26.3% versus 24.5% in full year 2019. 
We ended the quarter with a non-GAAP earning per share of 68 cents, an increase of 10% versus Q4 2019, mostly due to the higher operating profit as well as the lower tax rate. For the full year 2020, non-GAAP earning per share was $2.57, an increase of 17 cents compared to the full year 2019 and 2 cents above the high end of our 2020 guidance. Now, let's take a moment to discuss our overall spend base. We declined for the third straight year. On slide 20, you can see that we had a modest decrease in our spend base in the fourth quarter, but for the full year, it declined 474 million. More than half of the annual decrease was due to a lower cost of goods sold, partially related to a lower annual sales as well to our ongoing efforts to transform our global operational network. Lower operating expenses also contributed to the decline in spend based on due to the ongoing active management of our operating expenses. Looking ahead to 2021, we expect the overall spend base to continue to decline, but at a more gradual pace, mainly due to our effort to reduce our cost of goods sold through procurement cost excellence, network optimization and restructuring, operational quality excellence, and to end supply chain integration and agile operating model and organization. This ongoing effort, along an increase in the top line, will lead to further growth of the operating margin improvement in 2021 with the ultimate goal being 28% operating margin by end of 23. Now turning to free cash flow on slide 21. Tevas free cash flow in Q4 2020 was 471 million versus 974 million in Q4 2019. Please keep in mind when considering the year over year decline that Q4 2019 was unusually high mainly due to a one-time sale of assets as well as 95 million benefit from an interest rate swap transaction. For the full year 2020, free cash flow was 2.1 billion, which was flat versus full year 2019. I'm very pleased with the work our team has done to minimize the large quarterly swings in our free cash flow, which we had experienced in previous years. As you can see here, the quarterly free cash flow results were fairly consistent throughout 2020. Turning to slide 22, our cash to earnings for full year 2020 was 75% versus 79% for full year 2019, as free cash flow was unchanged, but Net income was 200 million higher in 2020 versus 2019. Despite the drop, we are on track to achieve our long-term goal of at least 80% cash to earnings a year by end of 2023. Turning to our outstanding debt on slide 23, net debt declined to 23.7 billion versus 24.9 billion in 2019. This reflects repayment of 1.9 billion during 2020, which was partially offset by a 900 million negative foreign exchange impact. Our net debt to EBITDA at the end of 2020 was 4.8 times versus 5.3 times at the end of 2019. We are very pleased with the progress we have been making each year to bring our overall debt load lower than the net debt to EBITDA ratio closer to our long-term targets of under three times by the end of 2023. Looking ahead to 2021, it will be another year of debt reduction totaling 3.2 billion, including our 0.25 convertible senior debentures, our 26. Due to the net share settlement feature, these convertible senior debentures were classified on the balance sheet under a short-term debt. Holders of the convertible debentures were able to cause to Teva to redeem the debentures on February 1, 21, and 491 million of the convertible debentures were redeemed on that date. As we have stated since 2019, our liquidity and expected cash flow will cover bond repayments for the next two years before having to refinance later maturities, including for 2023. Now, let's look at the development of 2020 results versus our guidance here on slide 24. We present the full year 2020 performance compared to the original guidance issued at the start of 2020, as well as the revised guidance from November, where we lowered the win point of our revenue guidance by 150 million while bringing up the bottom and the end of the range for operating income, EBITDA, and earnings per share. We are very pleased with the overall performance in 2020, especially given the uncertainty that was created by the global pandemic. Despite these challenges, the efforts of our employees around the world allowed us to meet the five main components of our 2020 outlook as well as to continue to make progress towards our long-term financial targets. Now, let's turn to our attention on our 2021 NANGAP outlook, which we are introducing for the first time today. Here on slide 25, you will find the five main components of our outlook. Revenue, operating income, EBITDA, earning per share, and free cash flow, as well as additional components including expected revenue range for key products. As I just mentioned, our company worked extremely hard throughout 2020 to anticipate and navigate the pandemic, its effects. And despite the significant amount of progress made around the world, especially by our industry, to battle the spread of the virus, we expect to continue to face an evolving environment for the purchasing partner, 
of our larger global customers and overall utilization by patients. With this in mind, we begin with 2021 total revenue, which we expect to be between $16.4 billion to $16.8 billion. Please note, this range reflects the divestment of $240 million in 2020 revenues from generic products in Japan, along with the manufacturing sites. The divestment was announced in July 2020 and become effective on February 1, 2021. We have factored into our guidance the continued erosions of global Copaxon revenue, which we expect to decline during 21 by approximately $300 million to approximately $1.50 billion full year 2020. The majority of the decline is expected in the U.S. due to a third generic entrant later this year. The expected decline in compaction sales should be more than offset by the ongoing growth of Facedo and Ajobi. We expect continued momentum of Facedo in both starative dyskinesia and Huntington disease, with the total annual revenue to grow to approximately $950 million in 2021. Furthermore, Ajobi is expected to benefit from continued patient growth in both the U.S. and Europe, bolstered further by our auto-injector device, which we begin to roll out last April after offering Ajovi in a pre-filled syringe the first two years. Global sales of Ajovi are expected to be approximately $300 million. With modest decline expected in our spend base, non-GAAP operating income is expected to be between $4.3 billion to $4.6 billion, and then a GAAP EBITDA is expected to be between $4.8 billion to $5.1 billion. Using a share count of approximately 1.1 billion shares, we expect earning per share to be in the range of $2.50 to $2.70. As you know, we do not provide quarterly guidance, but I thought it would be helpful to share with you how we are thinking about the progression of both sales and earnings throughout the year. Based on our expectation today, we do not expect to see the same trends that we experienced last year when we saw a big swing both up and down due to the global pandemic. Looking on 2021, we expect that the first quarter will be the lowest of the four quarters for sales and earnings, with gradual pickup in the second quarter. Overall, we would expect that approximately 48% of our 2021 sales will be generated in the first half of the year and approximately 52% in the second half. For annual earnings per share, approximately 45% will come in the first half of 21 and approximately 55% in the second half of the year. Hopefully, this color will assist you with your modeling. 2021 free cash flow is expected to be at the range of $2 billion to $2.3 billion. We expect about one-third of the annual free cash flow to be generated in the first half of 21 and the two-thirds to be generated in the second half of 21. This is due to unusual timing of annual bonus payments paid in the first quarter and inventories coming down due to a normal course of business. Lastly, looking at the tax, in 2020, our NAN-GAAP tax was 16.6%, which was below the 17% to 8% range we originally guide to. As we look to 2021, we expect the rate once again to be in the range of 17 to 18%. And this concludes our reviews of Teva fourth quarter and full year 2020 results and 2021 financial guidance. We will now open up the call for questions and answers. Operating, if you will please. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. In the interest of time, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question only. If you wish to cancel your request, please press the hash key. Once again, please press star 1 if you wish to ask a question. Your first question today comes from the line of Uma Raffet from Evercore. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, if I may, um, the CGRP trends quarter over quarter on a reported sales basis versus uh, what we're seeing in IMS, there seems to be a bit of a, um, there seems to be more going on than what volumes would tell us. I was curious if you could um, shed some light on that, as well as I noticed there's, a, uh, there's an antibody, uh, gastrointestinal is all you guys disclose on it, which is now in phase one uh, on your specialty pipeline. If you could give us any color on that. Thank you very much. Thanks for those uh, two questions. Uh, I'll address the last one, and then um, I'll let um, Brendan address the first one. So uh, I can't give you a lot of color on uh, our pipeline, the early pipeline. We don't really disclose a lot. But um, I can tell you that this specific project that is for celiac disease, and it's, a, it's an exciting uh, project, we might, uh, about a year from now, have a uh, day where we focus on the R&D pipeline, and then we'll give you some more color. But, but until then, uh, that's about all I can tell you. So um, Brendan, will you comment on the CGP trend? Sure, happy to, and good morning. So I assume what you're talking about is the uh, the increase in share uh, with the Jovi. As, as you've seen, our uh, total prescriptions and new prescriptions have basically doubled over 2020, um, and I assume that you're looking at uh, when the revenue uh, will, will kind of follow that. So if you think about the market, if a patient gets on a, a product, gets on a Jovi, oftentimes they're given a sample, and then they may enter our, our savings program for a period of time while we work through the uh, or while they work through the prior authorization process. So revenue tends to lag share by a bit, and uh, we've increased our access quite a bit in 2020. We'll continue to do so in 2021. So 
the expectation is, is that as our share continues to grow and rise, uh, you'll see revenue follow that, but as a lagging, uh, as a lagging indicator. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Greg Gilbert from Tourist. Please go ahead, your line is open. Thank you. Um, Core, in the, in the past I've asked you about the melting ice cube that is the generic business, and you corrected me by calling it more of an ice bucket. Um, so my question is, do you still think you can keep that business stable over the coming years based on uh, what you have? And is that sort of dependent on biosimilars or any other factors you'd point out? And then secondly, on opioids, uh, it seems like the wholesalers are getting close on a settlement, uh, as evidenced by their um, comments and their accruals, et cetera. Do you have anything new to say about where Teva stands in its opioid uh, discussions, and, and are you open to settling maybe in different ways, perhaps carving states out separately from other parties? Thank you. Thanks for those two questions. I would say on, on the ice cube question, I would more call the uh, North American generic business a well-working ice machine. You know, these machines you have in a bar where, where ice keeps coming out, so you always have ice. Uh, it doesn't overflow, so you don't get dramatically more ice. It doesn't melt uh, and go away, so you don't lose the ice. Uh, that's the same way within the North American business. Uh, and I think I've said for, I think, really two years, maybe three years now, it's roughly a $4 billion business in North America, and it's roughly a billion a quarter with the natural swings from uh, you know, launches, uh, various other swing factors. So I have great confidence in this business going forward. I have also said many times the prices are not going to get back to where they were. Uh, we do have the world's, if not the world's lows, but at least we have lower prices in U.S. than we have in Europe. It was just proven once more by the RAND um, Institute that issued a report recently, you might have seen it, where they conclude that uh, generic pricing is lower in the U.S. than it is in Europe, uh, which, as a side remark, is uh, interesting when we are being accused of, you know, rigging and doing a cartel on generic pricing in the U.S., that would be the worst cartel in history uh, resulting in lower prices. But that's another uh, discussion for another day. But it leads me to your other question, which is also about litigation, about the opioid situation. So um, I think that uh, we are close uh, to a settlement. So uh, can you say are the other companies involved in the framework? But there's a difference between being close and getting something signed finally. And uh, I've said before, uh, unfortunately, I think we need some kind of pressure for everybody to get together and, and you know, do final settlements in this space of opioid litigation. And so far, all the trials have been delayed. It's probably a year ago I was talking about the New York trial that was still at that point probably scheduled or maybe just about to get moved due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And since then, we've had one year of delays in the legal system for good reasons, of course, due to the pandemic. So I'm still optimistic about the framework settlement. I'm still very optimistic about uh, Teva finally reaching an agreement, but I'm not so optimistic about the timing simply due to the fact that the legal system is not really up and running, and that means that that uh, event pressure that will probably get people to sign on the dotted line is really not right there uh, right now. Hopefully, as the pandemic gets better in the coming quarters, we will see a return with some pressure from some upcoming trials, and that will result in a, uh, in a final settlement. With regard to um, settling parts of it, then I think the best for everybody is is a framework that includes, uh, you know, both the states and the subdivisions. That would be the most elegant way to do it. But of course, you can imagine all kinds of different other ways of, uh, of settling it. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Elliot Wilbur from Raymond James. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks. Good morning. Good afternoon. If I could just ask you to provide some additional color, Core and, and Brendan around your commentary regarding the trends in North American generics business, just specifically thinking about the headwinds in terms of volume, price erosion, you know, what's your expectation for 2021 versus 2020, and, and more specifically, what should we be thinking about in terms of new product launches, new product contribution? We've been talking about generic versions of Porteo, Restasis, and NuvaRing for quite some time, obviously realized NuvaRing, um, but there must be some other key launches that have kind of moved into the moved into the target range here that we should be thinking about in 2021, and just wondering if there's any, also any date, certain launches based on settlements that uh, would give us a little bit more visibility into trends there. Follow up, just get your commentary around generic EpiPen market dynamics, We've seen pretty strong increase in demand, uh, unusually strong for this time of year, assuming there's some tie into COVID-19 vaccinations, but just wanted to see, you know, what you're seeing sort of at the stocking level versus what we're seeing in terms of uh, retail prescriptions. Thanks. Thanks for those two questions. So I'll give an overall uh, take on the North American uh, generics, and then uh, Brendan will give you some details on that and also answer the question on EpiPen. So if I go back to this um, analogy of the ice machine, then you can say the way I look at it is we have an effective machine that makes new ice cubes all the time in form of launches, be it biosimilars, complex generics, simple generics, 
and that means we have a steady flow of launches into the market. Of course, they don't come you know, every day. They come you know, here and there, and uh, sometimes there's more launches in one quarter than another. But on an MAT basis, we have a steady machine launching products, really adding revenue all the time. We also have the ice cubes melting down you know, in the container for the ice cubes, and uh, they're not melting very fast or very slow compared to how they used to. Uh, they're melting at a steady rate. So we don't have this phenomenon we saw, I think, in 17, 18, where they melted really fast, so we had really big price erosion. That's not what's happening, but it's not that they're not melting at all either. So I think we have a uh, you know normal level of uh, price erosion for uh, as we get more competitors on products and products get sold. And that whole balance, I think, is, is very uh, steady and natural, and that's why I keep repeating this. I know it's kind of oversimplifying it, and Brendan will give you some more details, but I keep repeating this, that we're doing $4 billion U.S. dollars on generics in the U.S., and, uh, and Canada. And I think we'll keep on doing that. I don't see that going to 6 billion. I don't see that going to 2 billion. I see that staying around uh, the 4 billion mark. And then we have the growth, of course, from our specialty products, and we have modest growth in our generic business in Europe uh, and in the rest of the world. But enough on the big picture. Over to you, Brendan, on the specifics for generic launches and EpiPen. Sure. Thanks, Gore. So there's a couple ways to think about uh, the generic business, and when you think about launches, uh, it's both number of launches and value of the launches. In 2019, we launched, I think, 45 or 46 products. In uh, 2020, we launched 15. Um, but the value of those products is, uh, was, was much different. So, um, you know, 2020 was a, a good year for us. And, um, you know, that was led by Chubat and the Tripla. As we think about 2021, we've already launched two products. Uh, we have another six or eight that we're, um, that we know we're going to launch. We're preparing to launch. And then we have a stable of uh, complex generics uh, up to maybe 11 that are possible this year, but of course we won't get all of those and we're not certain which ones we will get. So I like Core's Ice Machine analogy. Um, I think that that's very relevant. I think that we will launch more products this year than we did last year. It was nice to start out January with the approval on NuvaRing and launch that. That is a, uh, uh, should be a very good product for us. We're a little late to market, so the value isn't going to be this year what it, you know, what it would have been uh, two years ago had we launched it, but it still should be, um, still should be good. And as we think about the rest of 2021, as I mentioned, there's a stable of uh, uh, 10, 11 complex generics, and some of them we've talked about for a while. It's teraparatide is possible, octreotide is possible, cyclosporin is possible, um, you know, exanatide is possible. So there's some, there's some products in there. Will they all come? Uh, no, but we're working with the FDA on all of those. And uh, I agree with Scores comment. It is a, uh, a $4 billion business that we can, that we can likely grow in the, in the low single digits. And, um, um, you know, it, the a uh, billion dollars a quarter kind of uh, ebbs and flows depending upon the launches that occur and the timing of those launches. So hopefully that provides more color for you. Uh, on the EpiPen comment, EpiPen, you know, we're still seeing that as a uh, a significant product and revenue generator for us. I think that uh, you're right. There could be some uh, stocking with uh, with the COVID-19 injections, but I wouldn't necessarily think of that as, as, as a major event. Um, I think that uh, um, that could be a slight boost here and there, but I don't think that that's going to add significant <clears throat> significantly to the overall EpiPen franchise. So, so thank you for your question. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Annie Fadia from SVB Learning. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking the question. Um, I had one follow-up and then uh, one main question. So the main question is, as you think about deleveraging uh, over the next couple of years, how do you think about maybe adding additional growth drivers to the product, uh, what are you doing in terms of thinking about, re, you know, refocusing R&D or any inorganic opportunities uh, to drive growth in the coming years? And then secondly, just with regards to your comment on growth outside the U.S., uh, can you talk about some of the pushes and pulls as we think about Europe and the rest of the world? Thanks. Thanks for those two questions. So when it comes to deleveraging, then as you saw in the presentation, we're fully committed to using our cash flows to reduce debt and to get below uh, the three times net debt to be done. Now, that does not mean that we're not doing any in-licensing, that we're not doing any uh, early stage R&D in-licensing, but it does mean that we're not buying any companies and we are not buying, you know, big late stage assets uh, that have maybe already been approved and so on. We are, however, working with companies where our commercial footprint is attractive, and that means that big upfronts are not needed, but uh, that together we can generate value. And if you look at the in licensing, for instance, of the Alvotec uh, biosimilar portfolio for the U.S., then that's a good example of that. Uh, no dramatic big upfronts, but a big uh, value if everything works out well. So, so that's the kind of deals that we like. We also do a lot on early research collaboration, early leads. So we take uh, products into our early development. Of course, that doesn't lead to products in the market until 10 years from now or something like that. So I would say don't expect us to do big moves that will drive additional growth on you know, the next uh, two to five years basis. 
we will be doing small in licensing, uh, which can help us, but we will not do anything big because we will stay committed to reducing uh, the debt and the net debt uh, to EBITDA ratio. On the terms uh, of growth outside of the U.S., then you can say in Europe we have a very steady business. We had uh, last year in 2020, once again, the highest absolute profit ever in uh, Tether Europe, and we're very optimistic about the future in general. We do see, as it was reported also by Ellie, that we still in the second half of last year, so in the third and the fourth quarter, volumes in Europe were still below where we would naturally see them, not dramatically, but maybe 3-4% in the overall generic uh, market in, in Europe. And we think that will continue for the first um, couple of quarters this year, simply due to the fact that we still have a lot of lockdowns in Europe, and that means that we won't get back to the uh, completely normal market situation. We are optimistic that after the summer we'll see a more open European economy, which means that patients will return probably in full volume to hospitals, to doctors, and that means that we'll see some higher volume uh, in the second half. Uh, longer term, we do expect to see low single-digit growth in, in Europe, and the same thing goes for the rest of the world, you know, uh, Japan, China, Southeast Asia, Latin America. We do, ex we do see volume growth and also value growth in the generic space there, and then, of course, we see growth from our specialty products being launched, so, for instance, Ajovi is going to be launched in Japan together with our partner, Otsuka. We've just launched Osteto in the China, it's, it's come on the national drug reimbursement list. So we are, of course, also expanding with Ajovi Estero around the world, which will also contribute to growth outside of the, of the U.S. So overall, we are expecting to see low single-digit to mid-single-digit uh, growth over the coming years. Thanks for the two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of David Reisinger from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, thanks very much, and congrats on the uh, the very strong performance. So my two questions are, first, uh, obviously the company's financial progress has been impressive. Could you discuss the company's flexibility to manage potential future cash litigation payments? And second, um, there's been discussion of a comprehensive settlement. Uh, Cor, could you please you know, provide a little bit more color on that, how you define that, and ensure that it covers all U.S. claimants? Thank you. Thanks for that question, or those questions. So first of all, of course, we have a situation, as we've just been reviewing, where we have more than $20 billion in debt, which basically means that we don't have any uh, free cash uh, laying around. Of course, that doesn't mean that we can't have a cash component in a settlement, but it just means that we don't have the capability of you know, paying $5 billion tomorrow in cash. That, that's not the kind of balance sheet that, that we have. And this is why we've been uh, negotiating with the state AGs and agreeing on a framework that's based on us basically providing what we are good at providing, which is generics. Uh, so we are uh, offering to provide generic suboxone to all states in the United States. That means that they can get going on uh, therapy for people who are suffering from substance abuse, and they can save lives with the use of generic suboxone. So we think that's a really good way to help the situation, to improve the situation. And then we are aware of other companies who will not be able to uh, contribute like that, and they will be contributing cash. And, and I think it's to the benefit of the American people that this thing gets settled uh, because we can discuss it forever, we can have litigation forever, but that doesn't help anybody uh, of the individuals that are suffering from substance abuse. Now, in terms of what is uh, the likelihood of, of a comprehensive settlement, of course it has to be understood that there's a framework that involves five companies, but technically each company is settling on its own. There's coordinated uh, negotiations, discussions, and so on, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a legal entity, a company is a legal entity, and the, each settlement will be done on its own. And of course, we would like to settle with everybody, so both the subdivisions and the states, we think that should be possible, that should be beneficial for everybody to get uh, this thing off the table, so to speak, and start helping people uh, all around in all the states. So I'm still optimistic that the framework is the right solution, and as I told you, I'm a little pessimistic on the timing, and a key reason for that is that you have 50 states involved, you have a lot of companies involved, you have, you know, uh, maybe 1,500 plaintiff lawyers involved. So you have a lot of people who need to get together, but it would be a good idea for everybody, I think, if we were to push this framework over the finishing line and uh, get it signed, sealed, and delivered. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nathan Rich, Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Great. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, first, I just wanted to dig into the, the operating margin guidance for this year, the 50 basis points of improvement. Um, Ellie, could you maybe help us think about, uh, you know, how you're, how you're thinking about gross margins next year? Um, it seems like you have several kind of positive tailwinds with the specialty business continuing to grow, you know, additional facility rationalization. You know, you talked about a stable kind of North American generics business. Um, so I was just kind of wondering why we wouldn't see maybe more um, or gross margin improvement kind of consistent with 2020, given those tailwinds. I know there's a J Japan divestiture in there, too. So just wondering what, what kind of the swing factors are on, on operating margins that we should keep in mind. Um, 
And then as a follow-up on Estetto, the guidance um, was stronger than we had anticipated. I think implies about 40% growth year, year over year off of a very strong year this year. Um, so, Core, maybe just where do you see the biggest opportunities to continue to grow Estetto? And I know you've um, talked this year about it, you know, being impacted by the ability to get into doc offices. Um, have you started to see that improve? And is that one of the factors um, that, that led to the guidance that you gave? Yeah, thanks for those two questions. I think, Ellie, you'll start with uh, the question on operating margin, and then I'll take Estetto. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks for the question, uh, Nathan. So, you know, if you look on the trajectory on the slide that Core, uh, in his part, on the on the operating margin, you know, moving from 24.5% on, on 2019 when we actually uh, really introduced uh, last year uh, uh, our plans and heading to 26.3% and actually looking to the 26.8, you can see that 2020 become kind of a pivotal year for us. So I would say the OP a margin over the gross margin in 19 was kind of a 47%. Now we actually came to kind of a 50-50. And, and heading to 21, we should, you should think about our margin to be a flow from the gross margin on the OP more than 50%. Uh, really close uh, to what we're saying, the midpoint 26.8%. And, and uh, you can actually look on, okay, we did kind of a more than one point year over year, but heading less than one point. Uh, one of the elements here we need to remember is that actually we are looking for uh, going forward um, uh, midpoint on the revenue versus uh, last year, if you remove the, the investment on Japan. Uh, what we did this year, we work heavily on the OPEX to make sure that we have really, really uh, great cost structures. We are looking on um, moving uh, forward uh, to supporting some uh, better mix on the revenue, and that's actually uh, with kind of a, a bit higher uh, percentage-wise in terms of the OPEX uh, for next year. So we're still kind of um, looking to grow and, and, and looking on how we actually can uh, support it with sales marketing and other activities. Uh, but I would say that uh, the direction is to actually flip it and flow through uh, more than 50% from the gross margin into the OP. So I think that's the way you should think about it. So uh, on Ostedo, I'll just give the overall comment, and then, Brendan, you can also give some details if, if you want. So basically, we are continuing the very strong trend we've seen on Ostedo, so it's not a dramatic change. What, what is important here is that we can continue to grow, and the reason why we believe so is the big unmet medical need. There's a lot of patients out there suffering from tardive dyskinesia who can be treated, who are not being treated, and they can get a huge help in their everyday quality of life. Uh, and, and therefore, we see that New patients are coming on it uh, all the time. Of course, we've had some hurdles on our communication with doctors face-to-face -face during the pandemic. We expect that will continue to some degree, but we've also overcome some of that through different tactics. And, uh, and maybe, Brendan, you can comment a little bit on how, how do we see tactically that we will keep on driving the growth of a state in, in the U.S.? Sure. Happy to, Cor. So, you know, at the uh, outset of the pandemic, I think we were able to move quickly to uh, virtual and video detailing with physicians, and it's certainly... Uh, not necessarily as impactful as in in person face to face detailing as far as generating a, a new to brand prescription, but uh, certainly it, uh, it it played a it played a role. Uh, we've been able to return to the field um, where state and local uh, guidelines will allow. Um, so we're continuing to engage with physicians. As far as the unmet medical need that Core talked about, the patient population for tardive dyskinesia is probably in the 500,000 range. Um, number of patients, about 26,000 patients today are treated between the two products in the market. So it's a little more than 5%. So there's still significant uh, opportunity in, tar in the Tardive market. And then when you think about, uh, you know, Korea associated with Hun Huntington's disease, there's about 38,000 patients in the U.S. with Huntington's. About 30,000 of them have uh, Korea associated with Huntington's, and only about 2,600 of those patients are treated, so a little less than 10%. So there's still significant opportunity with both tardive dyskinesia and Huntington's disease. Uh, I think we've really just scratched the surface on this market. Um, as we continue to grow through 2021 and uh, the pandemic improves, we'll uh, have a greater percentage of our, of our details uh, being face-to-face. -face. So uh, we certainly see some, uh, some good upside and some good growth coming uh, from Osteto, both in, uh, in 2021 and the out years 2022 and beyond. So thank you for the question. So I think now we'll take uh, the last uh, set of questions uh, because we're getting close to the hour. Thank you. Your final question comes from the line of Jason Jerberry from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. Hi good morning, and, and thanks for squeezing me in. Yeah, so I guess um, uh, my first question, Core, is just is there an opportunity for ANDA distribution in 2021 to play a bigger role in COVID-19 uh, vaccine distribution? You, you talked a little bit about the uh, Israeli experience. Is that a, a one-off, or, or are these opportunities – not available to um, type it more broadly. And then my, my, my other question uh, or follow-up question is, you know, as it pertains to the uh, the DOJ legal matter that you referenced earlier with the, uh, the price uh, fixing suit, I know that there was an attempt to get the civil matter stayed uh, pending resolution of the DOJ case, um, and, and I think the court balked at that. But but is there still the potential for getting the civil matter stayed, or, or could we um, anticipate both legal matters sort of proceeding in parallel uh, uh, this year? Thanks. 
Thanks for those two questions. I'll try to answer them relatively briefly. The first uh, question on ANDA uh, is a yes. Yes, ANDA can potentially play a role in helping states to get vaccine distribution going in a good and safe and reliable way. Uh, we know how to do it. We're doing it, as you know, uh, in Israel. And ANDA has the capability to distribute nationwide uh, to any pharmacy uh, that you can imagine or any location you can imagine. So, so it is a possibility. Whether uh, there will be a need for it, um, I'm not sure. But it's definitely something that we are offering uh, to the, uh, the healthcare system right now if they need, uh, if they need help uh, on that front. With regard to the, um, the DOJ criminal case on uh, price fixing and the civil case, then there was actually a development uh, yesterday, I believe, where in the civil case we explained uh, to the judge uh, that, uh, or we have been explaining to the judge, that it doesn't make sense to focus on Teva since we have denied any wrongdoing and we have a, we have a criminal case uh, waiting. Whereas some of the other, play, uh, the other defendants, they have already said that they did something wrong, such as Heritage and other companies. So it doesn't make sense to focus on us in the civil case. It would be much more relevant to focus on the companies that have said they've done something wrong and then dig into what have they actually done. And um, in, in layman's term, then the judge has agreed to that, and that means that Teva won't be at the forefront of that case. It will be some of the other companies. And then uh, you, you could say in that sense, the case is not stayed because there's you know, 15 different defendants, including Teva, but it will not focus on Teva. It will focus, I think, on Heritage and some other companies. Is, and, um, and then the criminal case will, of course, take its time, and, and we'll have to see that, how that develops over the coming years. So uh, thank you for those two questions, and uh, with this, I think we will uh, end the questions, and thank you all very much for your interest in Teva. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This conference will be available for replay from 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today through until 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday, the 9th of March, 2021. You may access the remote replay system by dialing plus 44-33-33-009-785 and entering the access code 54-58315. That number again is plus 44 785 using the access code 54 That does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may all disconnect. <laughs>